Uh, good morning to those who are watching online. We're excited that you get to be with us this morning. Uh, I want everyone to close their eyes as we start out this morning. So go ahead and close your eyes. No looking around. How many of you like romantic comedies? Raise your hand. All right, I'm glad that we have everyone's eyes closed. All those men that want to put their hands up, they don't have to feel ashamed. Thank you, Kyle, for your honesty. All right, you can open your eyes now. Uh, what is your favorite romantic comedy? Is it Sleepless in Seattle? Is it When Harry Met Sally? Is it Divine Sisters, Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood? I don't even know how to say the word. Uh, is it the Traveling Pants one? Is it Rocky one through five? I mean, it doesn't get any more romantic than, yo, Adrian, I mean, come on. I used to think that the book of Ruth was the romantic comedy of the Bible. It was the rom-com, and I would avoid it. Uh, there's a lot of romance. There's a lot of dialogue. In fact, 55 out of the 85 verses in the book of Ruth are all dialogue. Uh, there is no fighting, no explosions, no zombies, no Chuck Norris jokes. There just wasn't a lot there that would excite me. For the longest time, I would avoid it, and I would rather read Better Homes and Gardens or watch the Lifetime channel, then read the book of Ruth. But lately, I've been addicted to it. I've been reading it a lot. In fact, I was at the beach the other day, and I was just reading through it. And it's only four short chapters. It's easy to read through. And uh, in fact, you can spell out the whole book of Ruth with the name Ruth as an acronym. It, it starts with ruin. Then there's this dramatic U-turn which then leads to true love and hope. Okay? You can outline the entire book with these four words. Ruin, then there is, oh, we went away already. All right, points over. Ruin, a U-turn, true love, and then hope. All right, we're going to start with Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it. If not, it will be on the screen. Trust me, it is accurate. In the days... When the judges ruled. This isn't like Judge Judy. This isn't Philip Banks from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. This was men and women that God sent to rescue Israel. People like Gideon, Deborah, Samson. People who said, hear ye, hear ye, you need to hear God more clearly. Thank you. The story takes place sometime between 1200 and 1300 B.C., which is a really long time ago. It's when TVs were still black and white. Uh, horsepower still meant you use horses. And the Bucks last won their world championship. So we're talking a really long time ago. The book of Judges says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That phrase is used four different times throughout the book of Judges, which is when Ruth takes place. There was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and what was right in their eyes wasn't always right in God's eyes. Every day was like Las Vegas. It was 400 years of anarchy and apathy. People went from being like Mother Teresa to like Pastor Dan to like Marilyn Manson to like Aaron Rodgers. It was real bad. It was this constant cycle of rebellion, ruin, repentance, and rescue. And each time the cycle got worse and worse. But we're often guilty of doing the same thing. One moment I'm head over heels in love with God, and the next I'm making the devil smile. I say something I shouldn't, I think something I shouldn't. I just thought something I shouldn't. But I'm not going to say it. We all struggle to stay in line and in tune with God. We make these huge commitments, these huge promises. We have these sweeping moments of excitement, but then we struggle. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. There was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Everyone say Moab. Bethlehem means the house of bread. It sounds like my son's dream home. The house of bread. Uh, you've heard of carnivores. He's a carbivore. He just wants 
bread. Uh, if I ask him, Colton, what do you want for a snack? He will literally say, bread. Uh, he would go to Red Lobster just to have the biscuits. I walked in on him one time literally holding a piece of toast in one hand and a bag of crackers in the other. Just carb on top of carb. And then I jokingly said to him, I says, hey buddy, scripture says you shall not live on bread alone. To which he says, I'm not a man yet, and he pats my belly. <laughs> Bethlehem was known as the house of bread. You know that times are rough when the house of bread runs out of bread. There's no pumpernickel, there's no sourdough, no wheat, no wonder bread. It would be like Hershey, Pennsylvania running out of chocolate, or Antarctica running out of ice, or Seattle running out of depressing music. We are talking about a desperate situation. The housing market crashes, the unemployment is rising, poverty led to an increasing crimes, people are living on ramen noodles and they can't find toilet paper on the shelves. In other words, it was a time unlike our own, something we wouldn't be able to relate to. But God had promised the Israelites that as long as they lived within the borders of Israel that he provided for them and that they obeyed, he would always provide for them and protect them. That if they lived within the borders and they obeyed, he would provide and protect them. In fact, Elimelech's great-grandson David said in Psalm chapter 33, he said, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, and those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death, and catch this last phrase, and to keep them alive in famine. It doesn't say to keep them from famine, but to keep them alive in famine, that even if a famine comes, God has the ability to protect and to provide. A friend of mine was telling me recently that she felt prompted to give $20 to somebody. And when she went into her purse, she noticed that all she had was $20. This is what she was going to use for groceries. This is what she had for the day. But she had that holy pestering, prompting, I need to give this $20 to this individual. And she did. As soon as she got home, she went to the mailbox, and inside was a note with a $20 bill addressed to her. God knows how to keep alive even in famine. He knows how to take care of his people. David also says in Psalm chapter 37, The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be afraid in the evil time, and those times will come. And in the days of famine, they shall be what? Satisfied. Even in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Elimelech doesn't trust God to hold up to his end of the bargain. He doesn't trust God to take care of him and his family. Rather than dealing with the root problem of why is there a famine to begin with, which was often God's way of getting their attention to say, hey, something's going wrong in the nation. Something's going wrong in the land. You need to repent. You need to return. Rather than seeking God, he goes and seeks help elsewhere. Rather than repent, he chooses to run. Moab was 20 to 30 miles away from Bethlehem. That's if Naomi was driving. If it's him, it's like 300 miles because there's a lot of circles taking place. I want to show you a picture Bethlehem and Moab. There you go. It was just on the other side of the Dead Sea. It could re be reached within a couple days' journey, but morally, it couldn't be further away. Well, while it was physically wasn't far away, morally, it couldn't be further away. The people of Moab had oppressed the Israelites for 18 years. They had oppressed Israel. They served a god, Chemosh. There was child sacrifice, temple prostitution. They didn't celebrate important days like Pastor Dan's birthday. It was a wicked community. Ruth chapter 1, verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now I know some of you are looking for potential baby names, for your kids, your grandkids, may I suggest that you don't choose Malon and Kilion because it would be like calling your kid swine flu and athlete's foot. 
The meaning of these two guys' names is awful, and I will explain it in a minute, okay? But there, there's a picture that's being outlined for us even in the names that are being given going into the book of Ruth. All right, so I'm going to show you a picture here. So you start off with Elamelech, which means the Lord is my king. Then you have Naomi, which means pleasant. But then you have Malon, which means sickly. And then you have Kilion, which means death. Not the names you want to give your kids. But the message is that when God stops being your king, things can be pleasant for a little while. Sin is enjoyable. There's a reason why people do it. At first, it can be pleasurable. But then it leads to sickness and death. It starts off with God as king, but then they take matters into their own hands. And at first it seems pleasant, but then it starts leading to death. And we will see that in the text. You see, we justify our actions by saying, I'll never let it get that far. I have more self-control than that. I'm just going to look, not touch. I'm just going to try it once. I'm just going to skip this week. I'm just going to see what the big deal is. While the text says that they intended to stay a short while, that short while turned into 10 years and became devastating to their family. Sin will take you further than you want to go and cost you more than you'll want to pay. Ruth chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now we don't know how he dies. We don't know if it's natural causes or he got ran over by a camel. We don't know what happened. All we know is that things spiral out of control quickly. First, they lose their home, their job, their retirement plan. Now they lose their husband, their father, and they give their sons these terrible names, sickness and death. It's like people put their life into a blender and didn't give an off button. Their lives are falling apart. Ruth 1, 3-5. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah. Just a little aside, on the Oprah show a few years ago, she was explaining that she was originally supposed to be named Orpah. Her mom wanted to name her after the biblical character, but on the birth certificate, the letters got mixed up and she became Oprah. So for those of you who are best friends, refer to her as Orpah from now on. Okay, there you go. The only thing some of you will remember from this morning. Ruth chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. And the other, Ruth, after they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. To understand how desperate this situation is, you have to understand the context. You have to keep in mind that typically when a woman became a widow, she didn't have very many options. Either she had to remarry, she had to move in with her mom and dad, or she was taken care of by her sons. None of those were an option for Naomi. Her situation seemed helpless and hopeless. There was no Medicare. There were no retirement homes. There was no Walmart hiring older people to work for them. Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Elimelech went seeking what the Lord in his own time was already going to provide in Israel. He went to Moab trying to find what God was already going to provide if he would have just trusted. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And some of you, like Elimelech, are experiencing some rough stuff, and your temptation is always to run. That whenever life gets hard, the first thing you do, your knee-jerk reaction is to run. Metaphorically, of course, most of us are too lazy to actually physically run. We actually had a bat in this building a while ago. There was like a Bible study that was taking place on a Monday night. Bat came in. One person bolted. Like they were here, then they were out the door. Like Usain Bolt was looking at the security footage and seeing how he could run faster. Like this person ran so fast. Jerome didn't budge. He just looked at the bat, daring it to come at him. And like, like if the bat would have got closer, like his eyebrow would have hit it because he was like frowning so hard. <laughs> like, like you guys know like Jerome, how he can frown. is like he's about to take that bat out with that eyebrow. <laughs> 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 
But metaphorically, a lot of us run. We run from relationships. We run from church. We run from our job. Rather than dealing with the physical problem of why is there no food? Why is the famine happening to begin with? What's the spiritual problem that we're ignoring? We run. We bounce from relationship to relationship. We we bounce from job to job. We bounce from church to church without ever dealing with what God is trying to communicate to us through the difficulty. C.S. Lewis said that pain is the megaphone that God uses to get the attention of a deaf world. What is God trying to say to you? But you can't hear it because you keep running and running and running and running rather than repenting. You see, it's so easy to see everyone else as the villain and we're the victim, but we don't see our part of the equation. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. That was Ruth chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the name Mara means bitter. Side note. Tamra, who does our announcements, her root of her name is Mara, which means bitter, and she has a sister named Naomi. I think there's something subliminal going on in the family. I don't know what it is, but I think there's something going on. I just wanted to point that out this morning. All throughout the book of Ruth, God is always referred to as Yahweh or the personal name of God. But here, Naomi refers to him as Shaddai, which means almighty. In other words, God is all-powerful, but if he's all-powerful, then why didn't he protect us? Why did he allow my husband to die? Why did he allow us to lose our home? Why did he allow us to lose my kids? Why is it that Naomi, I mean, why is it that Ruth was never able to get pregnant? Why is it I have no grandkids? If God is El Shaddai, if God's the Almighty One, why has this happened to me and my family? You see, punctuation is important. Punctuation is important when it comes to sentences. You know, the colon and semicolon actually mean something besides just smiley faces. There's actually a grammatical function to them. You know, long before, people used to use like question marks and exclamation points and periods, and now we just use emojis to end our sentences. The punctuation matters. I want to show you a church sign. This is an actual church sign. Best sausage supper in St. Louis, come and eat Pastor Thomas Ressler. (laughs) Now, if you put a comma right after eat, that sign means something different. But as it is right now, that's gross. In fact, Abby has a a coffee cup that says, let's eat, comma, grandma, versus let's eat grandma. The, The comma means all the difference in the world. Punctuation is important when it comes to life as well. We often put a period where God has placed a comma. We often put a period where God has placed a comma. We jump to conclusions too quickly. If Naomi based her theology of God on her life up to this point, she would think that God has the heart of a Terminator T-800. That he's heartless. That he's allowed all these terrible, tragic things to happen to her family and she can't understand why. What is the story? If she ends here, she puts a period here, it changes how she sees God and how she sees life. See, in the 1920s and 30s, they popularized the phrase, to be continued. Everyone say, to be continued. With radio programs and magazines, it was always this cliffhanger, and it was meant to get you to come back next week for the program. Did you know that when Star Wars came out, with The Empire Strikes Back, It concluded with Darth Vader claiming to be Luke's father and Han Solo being captured and frozen and then audiences had to wait three years to find out what happens next. Now we anachronistically, we already know, so it's no big deal for us. We binge watch our shows. I don't have to wait a whole week. I just watch it over and over and over again. But that's not how life works. We need to keep in mind that sometimes it's to be continued. That this season in your life This page that you're on, this chapter that you're dealing with is not the end of the story. 
Stop putting a period where God has placed a comma. Naomi's story is not done at this point. It does not end in tragedy. While she is bitter, she says that. She says, I'm bitter. She's bitter like I felt after watching Space Jam Part 2. I thought the best thing about that movie is it made Michael Jordan look like a good actor from Space Jam 1. That, that was the best part. I was like, oh, Michael Jordan, that was actually pretty good. But while she refers to herself as bitter, I think she chooses her name strategically when she says, call me Mara. I think she's betraying that there's actually a little bit of hope that she's still holding on to. And I want to point out to you guys where she gets this name, Mara, from Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 through 25. And this is why I think she's still holding on to some hope. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to, everyone say it, Mara. Everybody means not three. They came to Mara. There you go. When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because why? It was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. This is where she gets this name. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became what? Fit to drink, or it becomes sweet. When she refers to herself as Mara, she's saying, I'm bitter, but I think she's still holding on to the hope that God still could potentially intervene. That he could still add some wood to the water. He could do something miraculous. He could still bring something that changes my situation around. Here's the thing. Naomi doesn't realize that the answer to her prayer is standing right next to her. It's called the book of Ruth and not the book of Naomi for a reason. When she comes back, she says, God brought me back, what, empty-handed. She's not empty-handed because she comes back with Ruth, and it's through Ruth that God is going to turn everything around. Some of us are already looking in the face of our miracle, and we don't recognize it. We're already standing next to the very thing that God's going to use to turn your situation around, and you don't even know it. You're saying, God, I'm empty. God, I'm bitter. And God's saying, allow me to turn things around. When my oldest was little, I walked in on him and one of his friends, and the friend was cleaning his room. And she said very enthusiastically, I'm cleaning Caleb's room. And I said, can I adopt you? Because uh, his room looked like an episode of Hoarders. And all of a sudden, Caleb comes around the, quarter, around the corner, and he says, and I'm going to pay her three quarters and a penny. It was very generous. To which she said, you don't have to pay me. This is what friends do. Friends look out for each other. Friends help each other clean their homes, which means I have no friends. I mean, if that's the definition of, of friendship. But I started asking myself, what does it mean to be a good friend? Just because you have thousands of friends on Facebook doesn't mean you know how to be a friend. That is not the definition of friendship. What does it mean to be a friend? Because some of us have some bad friendship habits. We take more from the relationship than we give. We quickly go from friend to frenemies if they just do something that offends us. We don't give the benefit of the doubt. We flatter the person when we're face to face, but then we talk about them behind their back. We're more concerned about their feelings than their future. We don't respond to their text, their emails, their phone calls. Pastor Jason is really good at returning phone calls and emails and texts. You guys got to listen. Remember, punctuation is important when it comes to communication. Amen. Ruth, on the other hand, is a great friend. If you want to know what friendship looks like, study Ruth. Ruth is a great friend. She's loyal even when it cost her. She invested even when it looked like she would not get anything out of it. She goes with Naomi to Israel even though she's likely to experience racism, poverty, loneliness, but her loyalty is going to be richly rewarded. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, the order of books are actually different. Did you know that Ruth comes after Proverbs 31? Proverbs 31 talks about the woman of noble character, and then you have the book of Ruth that shows what a woman of noble character looks like. In the midst of all this unfaithfulness during the book of Judges, 
all this unfaithfulness, you have a woman who shows what Hesed faithfulness looks like or the faithfulness of God looks like. But here's the deal. It's easy to be obedient and faithful when everyone else is being obedient and faithful. But can you do it when you're going against the grain and no one else is being faithful? Think about what Ruth risked to follow Naomi. First of all, Naomi describes herself as a bitter woman. How many of you like to hang out with bitter people? Nobody's hand went up. That's not the person you're inviting to your birthday party. When a person is constantly complaining, it's draining. You don't want to be around that person, right? A big game hunter went on a safari with his wife and mother-in-law, and at night, they went to bed, woke up the next morning, and the mother-in-law was missing. And the wife's freaking out. She's like, we got to find her, we got to find her, we got to find her. So he grabs his rifle, and they're going to go out, and they're going to find her. And to their horror, they discover that there's this big mountain lion, and then the mother-in-law is up against this boulder, and she's trapped. And, the mother's like, and then the wife is like, what are we going to do? And the man's like, nothing. The lion got himself into this mess. He's going to have to get himself out of this mess. I mean... <laughs> He's on his own. (laughs) Not only is she willing to endure Naomi's bitterness, but she's also willing to face racism and sexism. Seven times the author describes Naomi as a Moabite. It's never just Ruth, the Ruth. It's Ruth, the Moabite. And there's a reason why she's constantly described that way is because of the tension that would have existed. Remember, the Moabites enslaved the Israelites for 18 years. There was tension between those two communities, but Ruth was willing to go into that environment in spite of what she would face because of loyalty to her mother-in-law. In the words of another great Ruth, yesterday's home runs don't win today's games. Following God requires persistent faithfulness. Faithfulness even when it doesn't look like it's paying off. She was faithful even when her father died, father-in-law died. She was faithful even when it looked like she would never get pregnant. She was faithful even when she lost her home. She was faithful even when she lost her husband. At the point where she follows Naomi back, it doesn't look very promising. But she's faithful even in that moment. She chooses faithfulness even when it doesn't look like fruitfulness. She chooses faithfulness even when it doesn't look like fruitfulness. You see, sometimes you have to pray to stay. You have to fast to last and you have to read to succeed. Sometimes it's only in faithfulness in the long run that you finally experience what God wants to do in you and through you. Amen? Ruth chapter 2, verse 3. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. The phrase, as it turned out, is a biblical way of saying what looked like a coincidence is a providence. She just goes out to a field, and in her mind, she thinks she's just going to a random field, but God is providentially aligning her with the person who's going to rescue things. Throughout history, God has used both his right hand of overt miracles and his left hand of providence to lead his people forward. Within the book of Ruth, there are no overt miracles. There's no burning bushes. No one's raised from the dead. But God is constantly behind the scenes moving the story along. What's interesting to me is we were, we were raking some leaves in this neighborhood a couple years ago. As a church, we were going along. We were helping our neighbors out. And this woman, Donna, and I swear her, her house had like all of the neighborhood's leaves in her, in her yard. It was like a billion and four leaves. We counted them. And so we're out there, and we're raking, and she comes out, and she's just crying. She says, recently my husband died, and he was the one that always took care of the leaves. She says, I had shoulder surgery. I'm not able to take care of it. This morning I was literally praying that God would send someone to help me out with my leaves. And then we just showed up. God providentially knows how to move the story along Ruth was read once a year within the Jewish culture on the day of Pentecost. So every year on the day of Pentecost, they would read the book of Ruth. Out of all the books of the Old Testament that they could pick, they chose Ruth. 
And what's interesting is that according to legend, 606 of the commandments that were given to the Israelites were all done on Pentecost. Well, the, word, the, the number 606 actually spell the word Ruth if you look at it numerically. Out of the 39 books of the Old Testament, they choose Ruth every year, which is interesting to me because it's the only book named after a non-Israelite. There's two books that are named after women, Esther and Ruth, but it's the only one that's after a non-Israelite or a non-Jew, and yet they chose to read it every year. And in one sense, it makes sense to me. I mean, you pick the book that's four chapters versus Psalms, which is 150 chapters. I mean, that just makes sense. You know, like when my kids are like, hey, Dad, would you read to me? I'm not picking the biggest book on the shelf. We're not grabbing Tolkien. You know, we're going to grab Once Upon a Time, The End. You know, that's what we're going for. But that's not the reason why they read the book of Ruth. The book was a reminder that no matter how silent God might be, he's at work. That there's no overt miracles, there's no burning bush, there's nothing for them to point to, no Red Sea being parted, and yet God is providentially in every page moving the story forward. And so during their seasons of silence, they would turn to the book of Ruth as this reminder that God is still active in their lives even when they can't see him. Amen? The story of Ruth starts with tragedy. Ruth loses her husband, her brother-in-law, and father-in-law. In a short period, by the end of her story, though, the situation does a 180, and I'm going to be wrapping up in a minute. The situation turns a 180 by the end of the story. She goes from being a polytheist to monotheist. Her perspective on God completely changes. She goes from being a widow to a wife. From poverty to riches, from being childless to having a child, not only a child, but a child by the name of Obed, who is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. God completely turns her life around, and it's actually in the span of about three months. In three months' time, God takes Naomi from being a bitter woman who says, God brought me back empty, to a woman who is bragging that Ruth is better than seven sons. That's a huge compliment in that culture. God completely changes things in a three-month span. You might be depressed today, but who knows where God will take you in three months. You may be broke today, but who knows what God can do in your life in three months. You might be on the verge of divorce, but who knows what God can do with your relationship in three months. You may be bitter today, But who knows how sweet God can make that bitterness in three months. Don't put a period where God has placed a comma. Don't judge the miracle while it's still in process. Don't put the story away until God has finished the book. Your life isn't over yet.